Okay. We'll start uh, our class on white magic. And let me read again, rule 11, which we're covering. Three things the worker with the law must now accomplish. First, ascertain the formula, which will confine the lies within the inferring wall. Next, pronounce the words, which will tell them what to do and where to carry that which has been made. And finally, utter forth the mystic phrase, which will save him from their work. We're kind of headed toward uh, pronouncing the words, which will tell them what to do. But uh, he, uh, he has an unusual way of explaining these mystic phrases. And uh, sometimes he's explaining it, but he doesn't say he's explaining it. So you don't uh, really uh, uh, grasp uh, the, the, the relation there, but uh, it takes quite a bit of thought to uh, put all the pieces together that he, uh, that he gives in going through these rules. Now he says, uh, he talks about, um, uh, we left off where we were talking about the disciples of the world doing their part. And he says, when we fail to do our part of the plan, uh, the earth can take a destructive path and turn toward cataclysm, plagues, wars, all kinds of problems can be created if disciples of the world do not do their part. So it's important that we do our part. If we do our part, we're not going to have the apocalypse everybody worries about. But if we don't do our part, then we will have a, uh, uh, destructions come and then we'll have to like start over and sometimes if if there's too much corruption some uh destruction comes because the only way to make things work for so that we can progress is to let everything fall apart and then start over uh but that's that's not the uh most desirable way to go. The most desirable way to go is just to hold things together and to increase in light and uh, uh, forward movement step by step so that that doesn't have to happen. So what if some people do their part but others don't? Is there, well, or, there's or, always a handful doing their part, but a certain number have to do their part to uh, to make things work. So that's why you, you, for instance, may be the turning point. Let's say uh, you needed uh, 144,001 disciples out there doing their part, and you're the one, okay? And all of a sudden you don't do your part. Maybe maybe you're the one that's the deciding point there. So that's something to keep in mind. So if, if, you, are, if you are the crucial one to make the difference in the balance, uh, that's, that's kind of the way to think about it. Um, okay, um, yeah. The, the, the cataclysms and destructions will or won't happen depending on uh, a critical mass is that would be more people are becoming more enlightened then there'll be some destructions but less or is there what do you think is there just a cutoff line or what yeah dk pretty much tells us that the plan is for the new age to come in without a major cataclysm but he says there will be a certain amount of problems earth changes uh, eventually either, uh, down the road. But uh, we, the, the masters are hoping that enough people will uh, uh, be enlightened and do their part so that we can have a uh, peaceful transition from the age of Pisces to Aquarius. Now, if we don't do our part, he says there could be tremendous cataclysms and destruction. And so uh, uh, it's important. And he says by 2025, we'll kind of know whether or not uh, where we are here. And we're getting pretty close. We're up to 2019. And he said this, I think, back in the 1940s. Uh, so 
Um, we're getting pretty close to that uh, crucial date. Okay. He says, when humanity uh, does their part of the plan, the first effect of the response of the more advanced sons of man is to, is, uh, to the formulas as translated and transmitted by the knowers will be the establishment of right relations between the four kingdoms in nature and right relation between the units and groups and the human family. Now, as far as the human family goes, uh, right now looking at uh, right human relations is kind of at a low ebb. So that's, that's not very encouraging. We have, especially on the political side, we have one group demonizing the other group and both of them see, see the other side as being in league with the devil himself, pretty much so. Uh, on the other hand, he says that th these points of tension will often be followed by points by great progress. So if we're able to work out this tension that we have of uh, the left versus the right, and so it's uh, there's some type of uh, uh, understanding reached between the two sides, we can make a great leap forward. And it's interesting that this is happening just before this crucial date of 2025 that uh, that he he mentioned, but um, so that's uh, that's something to keep an eye on. Now he said he makes the interesting statement of right human re right relations between the four kingdoms. Now, um, so let's ask ourselves: for humanity and the animal kingdom. Have we made progress in right relations between humanity and the animal kingdom? How has that happened? What do you think? When we are starting to see, uh, you're starting okay. to see organizations that are being more animal friendly, animal conscious. Uh, we're starting to make uh, man wake up to the. Uh, pains and emotional disturbances of animals uh they're starting to relate to that so we're making progress in that that form yeah but, uh, that's... still man to man they're not doing too much because they're killing man faster than they're killing animals yeah right we're uh <laughs> terrible this is one area that he talks about that we have made progress we're a lot more sensitive to animals uh than we used to be when i was a kid uh it seemed like people looked on animals as if they didn't uh, have pain. If they caused an animal, if somebody caused an animal pain, they felt like it didn't really matter that much. And now people are much more sensitive to animals, and that's a good thing. Now, a lot of the animal rights people are going overboard. And this is an interesting thing as we have the a pendulum that swings back and forth. And when it swings one way, people tend to go overboard too much, like some of the animal rights people are actually attacking uh, people over different things. And, and uh, But the swing of the pendulum has caused us to be a lot more conscientious. Or, uh, they're exposing how uh, uh, animals or farm animals are on big, big farms are mistreated and so the the people are uh, the the businesses are making corrections now when i was a kid uh, it was mostly small farmers and they treated their animals pretty good but uh, these big farms some of the animals are really mistreated and that's being exposed and the public is outraged and a lot of the public is 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 gravitating toward vegetarianism because of sensitivity about uh, eating animals. And so that is increased. But how about in the vegetable kingdom, between man and the vegetable kingdom? Is that, uh, have, are we being more sensitive to uh, uh, that kingdom? What do you think? It, it seems some with like the organic and not pesticide stuff that maybe that's the case. 
Right. right. That's that's one point is that uh, we're moving more toward uh, organic things. And how about all these people who want to save the trees, don't want us to cut down any trees? Now, again, they're going too far to the extreme almost. But on the other hand, they're forcing us to think about being more conscientious about how we treat uh, uh, the vegetable kingdom. Uh, we've, we're concluding it's important yeah, we don't cut down all of our trees because the trees perform a great function on the planet. And so we have to have this balance. So we have the right number of trees, the right number of grasses, the right number of uh, 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 vegetable life throughout the planet that we don't destroy that which feeds us. And this is all part of the right relations. And, and we are making uh, progress in this area. I just wanted to say, it's also like... Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to say it's also like with the animal thing, like how much of it is real progress and how much is it the glamour of progress? Yeah. Uh, for one thing, uh, one thing they're get noted that um, <clears throat> chemicals uh, are poisoning the land and uh, of the land and the air and the water, the one main thing has to be saved for the future generation is the land. If you save the land, Mother Nature can replenish the air and replenish the water. But the land has to be sacred. And with this GMO poisoning and these other chemical poisonings, what we're doing is we're poisoning the only thing that can restitute everything else. It's the land. And so uh, this awakening now that this GMO is doing worldwide from the dark side to poison all the land, if we don't stop that and become more aware, we'll lose it. Uh, we'll lose it for the future generations, our children and grandchildren. Uh, if right, we don't and save the land, the air and the water will go. Yeah, and that's the um, that's an important thing. As he points out, is the last relationship is uh, uh, is with the uh, uh, mineral kingdom. The mineral kingdom would include the oceans, the land, uh, the air, and we've done a, a, quite a bit of damage to them all. And again, the swing of the pendulum causes many extremists to come out and and try to take us too far, too fast, or too impractical. But uh, the swing of the pendulum has made the average person more aware of the problem. So the problem is being worked on. And we are making some progress. At least we're aware, become aware of the problem. One thing I wasn't aware of was how much plastic was in the ocean until the last year or two. Uh, I think, boy, we've been really careless about dumping all this plastic in the oceans. It's, it's really crazy. And then the fish, of course, eat the plastic, and and a lot, uh, it does damage to them. And then we wind up getting uh, these chemicals back in our system. So uh, uh, we are at least working on this. Now we're working on our relationship with the animals, the plant, and the mineral kingdom, but we aren't working very much on us we need to work more on us too so this is this is where the real danger is right now is uh with with uh uh the problems of the left and the right demonizing each other and the tibetan points out that the 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 way to solve this is just the basic principle of goodwill of understanding that we're all in this together and to give our brother and sister the benefit of the doubt uh, as to being a, a good person with good intent. If we realize we can disagree with somebody, but if we see that uh, their intent is not bad, that their intent is really good, that's, that's a step to obtaining uh, a goodwill. And uh, a lot of people aren't doing that. They, they see uh, the other side as, as having bad intent. And uh, 
at best misled intent. But uh, uh, to see our brother and sister is, uh, is to see see within their heart almost everybody uh, that you meet, even people making big mistakes. They're they're trying to do what's right. Most people are, and we need to see that in all people. Uh, I read an interesting thing about a guy had a, a near death experience and. He, he, he was able to look at everyone he knew that he didn't like in his life, and he was able to see, put himself in their shoes. And when he, when he was able to do this and see through their consciousness, he completely understood why they did the things that they did that he condemned them for when he was in life. But when he was able to look through their consciousness he could complete he said he could could completely understand why they did what they did and this is kind of what we need to do as individuals we need to uh, to see other people isn't that called he walked what'd you say stacy uh, isn't it called something like he walked in their shoes uh he got that vision of inspirational he walked in their shoes yeah walk, saying, a, walk a mile and another so person see shoes. and feel yeah. with it yeah yeah okay he says there's currently problems in all four kingdoms self selfishness in the human kingdom cruelty in the animal kingdom and disease in the vegetable and soil and so uh even the kingdoms themselves have their own problems separate from us. Uh, the animals are cruel to each other. Now, we have an influence on the animals. If we become more loving as a race, than as a human race, then we will influence the animals. And uh, we will also help to eradicate disease and imperfections in the, the vegetable and uh, mineral kingdom. Uh, we also have the danger of us uh, increasing problems in these kingdoms, which uh, we pointed out earlier. So we want to avoid that. And one thing that he points out is that, you know, it looks like we're, may, it lo may look like we're doing more harm than good, but, uh, and we do go through a learning curve. As we're, we go through the learning curve, we may do more harm than good, but then once we do learn, then eventually the destiny of the human kingdom is to become the savior of this planet. We will become the saviors of the animal of the lower kingdoms, so to speak. And that's our, that's our destiny. So if we could look forward to a couple hundred years in the future, we would probably see that humanity is a much more benevolent uh, uh, kingdom than it is at the present time. Okay, uh, he he's comments a little bit here on pronounce the words which will tell them what to do and where to carry that which has been made. He says it is a soul that pronounces the words. So the disciple must obtain soul contact to get a vision of the plan so it can be manifested. So, in other words, if you're going to make a creation that's going to be useful to humanity, to be of service, the person must tune in to the inner voice and obtain the right words to, in, to uh, uh, guide that creation into manifestation. And if the person listens to the soul, to the inner voice, then he will create something that will be useful. If he doesn't, then that creation can be destructive. So one thing I have found in my life is that when I'm headed the right direction, in addition to trying to hear what the inner voice says, go by also what you feel. If you're headed the right direction in your creation and that what you're attempting to manifest, it will just feel right. 
You ever notice that? Let's pick on somebody here like Annie. Have you noticed that, Annie, that when you're headed the right direction, you just feel an inner peace about what you're doing? Yes. I think sometimes when I'm doing these things I think I should do, <laughs> <laughs> that um, I get more absorbed in them, you could say. I don't think much about time or space or anything. It's just like, it's very peaceful, yes. Have you ever gone through the opposite where maybe you're headed the wrong direction and you just felt fuzzy about it and and things weren't clear? Have you ever gone through that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Many times before yeah. I thought. And what, how, what, do you, what do you do when that, you get yourself in a situation like that? When I get fussy and... Yeah, yeah. What, how, how do you resolve that? Well, I, normally I just try to sit down. Maybe I listen to some music or I uh, try to meditate or something. I try to be quiet and, and sort of listen. And I can feel that, okay, do something else. Focus. Uh, focus is such a strong word for me. So I just shift my focus, you could say. Have you, now, when this happens uh, and you wind up headed the right direction, have, do you feel like a shift occurs? When yeah, absolutely, in the energy, yeah, sure. I feel much more at peace, much more happy, much more joyful, um, all the good feelings, <laughs> you could yeah. say. Yeah, you know, if you headed the wrong direction, then you turn around and head the right direction. It's an interesting thing to note that there's such a shift in energy. And the thing is about the right direction is often something that you didn't want to do. <laughs> but then oh, yeah. when you realize you're supposed to be doing it, then you have that shift. Does that register with you what I just said? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes you really have to use all your energy to get the things done. I mean, it's like, but it's very rewarding to do it then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He says here, the builder of any form is, first of all, a controller of lives, an arbiter of the destinies of certain entities. It is this thought. We have light thrown upon the subject of free will and upon the law of cause and effect. So he, he keeps reminding us of this, is that uh, we are a creator in charge of a tremendous number of tiny lives that are here to assist us. We're kind of like a God to our own universe. Now visualize God over like uh, uh, thousands of star systems and he's, he has all these lives here and he's guiding them toward a certain end. Well, in your body, you have like, uh, I think about 30, 40 trillion cells. And each cell has about uh, 40, 50 trillion atoms in it. So just think, you are a god to all of these tiny lives. And your thoughts actually influence them. And if your thoughts are in a, in a positive direction, they will pick that up and they will joyfully work with you. If your thoughts are in a negative direction, then they will not be as quiet as enthused, but they will also pick that up. So it's an interesting thought, and he keeps remind, reminding of this, how we are over all these tiny lives and that it's important that we register this so that we can become a true white magicians and create things that will be of service to humanity. He says we're mostly living in a world of effects generated by causes long past. And um, so he points out that, you know, even like trillions of things that happened trillions of years ago are still affecting us now. Things that happened lifetimes ago are affecting us now. Things that happened when we were little children are still affecting us now. And so these uh, uh, 
we have all these effects. We're living in a world of effects and the average person doesn't do much to create his own cause. He just goes by, goes with the flow, so to speak. And a lot of new age people really use that word go with the flow a lot, but uh, the advanced disciple knows when to go against the flow. And to be a cause, you have to be willing to go against the flow. And he says only an advanced soul can generate real cause. So think about that. Think about how you can be a real cause. Now, if he points out that uh, there's danger in being a real cause because if a person has, doesn't have pure intent and understanding, he can, be, uh, he can generate a negative cause. So we want to make sure we stay in the light, have good intent to serve so that we can create real cause for good. The person that can create real cause is a person that uh, uh, can generate great power. Now it's interesting in the Renaissance, they say the Renaissance was, the whole Renaissance was created by about 80 individuals. In other words, everybody else was pretty much going with the effects, but there was 80 individuals in the Renaissance that has been identified by historians that were generated real cause and they uh, created a, a, a whole new uh, uh, movement. It says, do, do not actions in one life create future effects somewhat but the greater cause is the group of souls that we work with and incarnate with. Early in incarnation, we identify with race, tribe, nations as we evolve. Our groups grow smaller until we learn to be a cause on an individual basis. And then we make contact through the soul with subtle group lives. So in other words, the young souls are, are associated with larger groups. You know, be their church or their nation, they identify with their nation, their group, their, uh, uh, and as the person progresses, he says the groups he identify with become smaller and smaller. And like this group here, it's, it's a pretty small group and we identify closely with each other a lot more than we would like uh, a whole country, for instance. This is, uh, and then eventually he says the person realizes he's pretty much on his own on a lot of things. And then when he reaches that point, he contacts the soul. And then he contacts the soul and then he gets in a subtle relationship with other souls on a subconscious level. And so he has a spiritual link that he gets. So he winds up being in a link with a large number of, of souls all over again. So on the physical level, it's interesting the progression is from a large number to a smaller number until finally he reaches soul contact and then he opens up a link to a large number again, but within his own soul group, there's a fairly small number of very close associates. It says in the first half of our evolution, matter dominates, and in the second half, spirit assumes control. So uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. Now he says he's going to present to us stages of human evolution, but stresses that of great, greater importance than the stanzas and formulas is a simple directive to live kindly, speak words of gentleness and of wisdom, and practice self-forgetfulness. 
This will speed our journey home more than anything. So in other words, he tells us, he, tell, he says, uh, we've got all these complicated esoteric stanzas and interpretations we can give you. But he says, going back to the simple fact of just being a good person <laughs> is, will help you more than anything. He says, have that as number one, and this is kind of like icing on the cake, uh, all these esoteric things that he gives us. So he's talking about uh, stages of uh, human evolution here. Stage one, the entity identifies with the form and instinct he identifies with desire, signified by the color red, which changes to rose and rose to pink and pink to white. So the colors symbolize the evolution that eventually takes place. So a person, uh, when the person begins his evolution, he's very much in contact with instinct. Now, a lot of misled New Agers think that uh, have taught that like the animals because they're very in tune with instinct or more evolved than us because they ha have better instinct than, than we do, you know. But he points out that we were that way when we began our evolution as humans, we had great instinct, but now a lot of our instincts, he says, are below the threshold of consciousness. He says they can be retrieved if we need to retrieve the instinctual part of ourselves, it can be retrieved. But uh, it's below the threshold of consciousness because we don't really need all those things. Uh, we put these things we have learned below the threshold of consciousness so we can shift our attention to something else. Because in order to really learn something new, you have to put almost 100% attention on it. And that means you have to take your attention off a lot of other things. So we've taken our attention away from instinct and put it on, put it on other things. Now the next stage, he says a picture changes form. Another voice coming from close at hand utters another phrase. The life continues on its way. Enter the field where children play and join their game. Awaken to the game of life, the soul passes the gate. The field is green and on the broad expense, the many forms of the one moving life disport themselves. They weave the dance of life, the many patterned forms God takes. The soul enters into the playground of the Lord and plays thereon until he sees the star with five points and says, that is my star. The star is but a point of light and yet a radiant sun. Now this is where the, uh, the feeling nature is developed. He, first of all, we develop the instinct and then we develop the feeling nature and this he calls the playground of the Lord. It's a playground because the feeling nature get, pulls us into experience. Oh, I want to do this and I want to do that. So we have, it, the, our emotions pull us into experience. So we were in the playground of the Lord and we play all kinds of games by using our feeling nature. And eventually we learn from these games and, eventually, and then we finally get tired of uh, playing them. And then we go to stage three heart and mind comes into focus and the pilgrim loses the desire to play and gains the desire to serve and to know his own soul orange and blue dominate but are not blended okay so we get tired of playing all these games As a matter of fact we even talk about games we we, we hear it, some people say i'm tired of playing games okay well the person that says that is really announcing that, well, I'm ready to move away from the astral control to the world of mind and creativity. And uh, so that's uh, uh, the next. Uh, and then we eventually move into stage four, 
Into the dark the life proceeds. A different voice seems to sound forth. Enter the cave and find your own. Walk in the dark and on your head carry a lighted lamp. The cave is dark and lonely. Cold it is and a place of many sounds and voices. The voice of the many sons of God left playing on the playground of the Lord make their appeal for the light. The cave is long and narrow. The air is full of fog. The sound of running water meets the rushing of the sound of wind and the frequent roll of thunder. Far off, dim and most vaguely seen, appears the oval opening. Its color blue, it's stretched a Athwart this space of blue, a rosy cross is seen, and at the center of the cross, where the forearms meet, a rose, and on the upper limb, a vibrant diamond shines with a five-pointed star. The living soul drives forward toward the cross, which bars his way to life revealed and known. Not yet the cross is mounted, therefore left behind, but onward goes the living soul, eyes fixed upon the cross, ears open to the wailing cries of all his brother souls. Well, that's kind of very esoteric wording, but what he's telling us there is, is after the person goes through developing the mind and then soul contact, he reaches a point to where he is willing to sacrifice everything. And there, there he talks about mounting this cross. And uh, mounting the cross is where he uh, uh, is willing to let all things go that holds him to this earth. And that's the difficult part in the journey of the soul and very few people have arrived there uh jesus pretty much arrived there in the in the garden of gethsemane where he made the final decision to let all his attachments go and submit himself completely to the will of the father then we go to stage five out into radiant life and light the cave is left behind. The cross is overturned. The way stands clear. So visualize Christ after the cross. And this, this is our ultimate destiny. He says, the word sounds clear within the head and not within the heart. Enter again the playground of the Lord and this time lead the games. The way upon the second tire of stairs stands barred. This by the soul's own act. No longer red desire governs all life, but now the clear blue flame burns strong. Upon the bottom step of the barred way, he turns back and passes down the stairs onto the playground, meeting the dead shells built in an earlier stage, stepping upon forms discarded and destroyed, holding the bands, the hands of helpfulness, Upon his shoulder sits the bird of peace, upon his feet the sandals of the messenger. Not yet the utter glory of the radiant life, not yet the entering into everlasting peace, but still the work, still the lifting of the little ones. Okay, and the interesting uh, thing is this time lead the games. Okay, in the beginning, the disciple plays the games. When he's attached to the, the feeling nature, and especially, he's, he goes into all these games. And eventually, our destiny is to lead the games. And to lead the games, you have to eventually reach the point where you can let all things go, become, let all your attachments go so that you can have a pure connection to spirit. When you have that pure connection to the spirit, then you become a leader of the games. And we don't have to have complete uh, mastery. We don't have to be a master to, be, uh, uh, to start that leadership. But uh, as a person 
obtains a certain degree of soul contact, he thinks, he begins to think about, well, what can I do to lead my fellow brothers and sisters to greater light? He says, but still the work and still the lifting of the little ones. That's always there for us as long as we are on the earth. We have that call to us. Still the work and still the lifting of the little ones. The little ones, of course, are those that are farther back on the path than yourself. They are uh, symbolized as the little ones that you can help. In other words, like when you have a, when you're a parent and have a child, well, you look upon these as little ones. You don't look on them as being lesser evolved or anything, but you just look upon them as these are little souls that need guidance and help until they can stand on their own two feet. And so the true servants will look upon those that he is able to help a little bit like a parent looks upon a child, that uh, you love the child. Uh, even when it makes mistakes, you still love it. And you want to do everything you can to lift it up and make sure that child uh, is able to take his next step with confidence. Okay, any uh, comments or questions before we wrap it up? So what he's saying is that we will be at play in the fields of the Lord until the last weary pilgrim makes his way home. Yeah, that's a good statement. The last weary pilgrim, that, and that's the way that's the attitude we got to take. Take here is uh, uh, it's going to be a long time before our work is done. Yeah. I was going to say that uh, if we're here till the last pilgrim leaves, that's a long time because there's a whole bunch of them don't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, actually the DK tells us that uh, this we will that we will be upon the earth until sixty percent of humanity reaches liberation, and I guess. I don't know. The last weary pilgrim, I suppose, will be the last of the 60% when it comes right down to it. Because then he says 40% uh, will go to another planet similar to Earth where they can finish uh, working off the rough edges. And then the 60% will move on to higher spheres. And so that's an interesting statement. But that will be... Uh, that will be millions of years in our future yet before that happens. It's going to take a long time to, it's not all going to happen like in the thousand year millennium type thing that the Christians believe in. But uh, our evolution takes a long, long period of time. But we're going to make, uh, if things go according to plan, we're going to make some tremendous progress over this during the Aquarian age. Because uh, the this age of Aquarius we're entering is interesting because you have uh, the zodiac, uh, we go through the zodiac of uh, approximately 2300 years for each sign, but then we have a greater zodiac where all 12 signs uh, compose a greater uh, circle of uh, over 25,000 years. And then there's a greater zodiac. And in the greater zodiac, we are in the age of Aquarius there. So we're entering the age of Aquarius within a greater zodiac of the age of Aquarius, which makes this coming age of Aquarius extra potent. So we're going to have uh, tremendous powers of Aquarius come into play during this uh, uh, stage we're entering, which only happens uh, once in a great cycle. So uh, the, the teachers point out that this is a, this is a great opportunity, opportunity we're entering into, and hopefully we can enter into it 
without a big uh, apocalypse happening first. Okay. Any other comments or questions before we wrap it up? Well, we just have to be aware that things are progressing as they should, and the ancient evils that have come been coming to the surface have to be brought out so that they can be dealt with. These things that are happening now in the news have to happen so that we can be aware of them. Yeah, that might be a lot of the purpose of Donald Trump is to bring uh, uh, everything to the surface so it can be dealt with. Because <laughs> he, uh, he certainly brings everything to the surface, the good and the bad. So uh, uh, he, uh, that might be a large part of uh, his, his purpose of being president right now. Okay. Have uh, you read this yet? Have you read anybody? Uh, Read this yet? Yeah, I've read it. It's pretty good. He's accumulated about everything DK yes. has to say about that time period. You know. Yeah. Good yeah. book to read. Yeah. Good chance. I have a question, JJ. Sure. Um, does is there any time frame for the swing of the pendulum from right to left? Is it like a decade, a hundred years, thousands of years? Because it goes right to left, right? Right. The, the swinging in the age of Aquarius, you have the, the uh, transition period, which lasts uh, several hundred years. Uh, the transition began really right around the time of uh, the founding of the United States, was the actual beginning of the transition in the age of Aquarius. And we have a lot of Aquarius energies that was behind the foundation of like the constitution and then and, and uh, the foundation of the country and but there's been a lot of Pison energies pulling the other direction now we've uh, uh, I believe the right the middle the midway point between the transition was the exploding of the atomic bomb in 1945 and that uh, signaled the uh, uh, the midway point. And then we got, um, right now we have probably about 100, 150 years before we're fully into the age of Aquarius. And during this time period, the energies of Pisces are fighting for their life. And Pisces energies are very strongly associated with the emotions, with idealism, presenting old ideals that uh, people want to impose upon humanity. And this attitude of imposing the ideal good upon humanity has to go, but it's struggling for ex existence. So visualize a, a living force that knows that it's under threat of death and it is fighting for its life like a cornered lion, so to speak. You get, you get a cornered lion, it's very dangerous. And so the energies of the old age are fighting for their life, and they are doing everything they can to impose their ideals by force upon us so that we cannot enter into the age of Aquarius. And it's going to take about 100 years for these to die out so that... Uh, uh, the, I, the true energies of Aquarius, which is governed by mind, and the seventh ray, uh, will come into play. And uh, uh, mind, we, in the age of Aquarius, we will have a much more reasonable uh, people in our government. And uh, there won't be the dichotomy of the right versus left nearly the way it is when the Aquarian energies are in, but they will be much more cooperative and oriented towards serving the whole rather than the party, so to speak. And so, uh, but all the old forces are fighting for their lives. And so we're, uh, we're at a point of tension right now as we're trying to move in. And like I say, it'd be about, probably about 100 years before uh, 
all these old energies are put in the right place. And uh, okay, any other comments or questions there? Yeah, I've been uh, dealing with the little lives in my neighborhood here lately. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> those being insects, bugs of all kinds. And and uh, I told all of them, I said, out spoke out, I said, look, you guys, you can be inside my house, you can be on my front porch, you can be anywhere around me, as long as you don't get in my face. Well, the hornets and, and the spiders, they get it. They're staying clear, and, and I, let them, I let them build wherever they want, as long as they don't get in my face. Well, the gnats, I'm going to have to invent some kind of hell for them, because they, they're just too... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point, Rick. Okay. Yeah, that time when Rick, that time when Rick came down to uh, come over to visit, he stayed for a couple of weeks. And when he first pulled in, I had him pull in back of the house by the water pump so we could hook him up with water and electricity and stuff. Well, he didn't know it, but he pulled right on the top of a couple of big ant piles. And they come in his motorhome and <laughs> ate him up. I mean, I had to get magic. I had to get magic powers just to get him off of him. Oh my god! That was. Oh wow! Wow! Yeah, yeah. A lot of people though claim to, uh, like Rick does. Does uh, a lot of people just give the insects a mental command to you know stay in your own place? And a lot of people claim that works for him. So. Uh, it's a good. Uh, yeah, it didn't that time for Rick. Nats, nats is no good. They they literally, literally drug him out of bed. I swear. <laughs> be darn. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Well, the battle is on the mental plane, so let's hold steady in the light and keep your positive mental attitude. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so happened this positive mental attitude was ant poison. It worked though. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. So you just never know for sure. Okay, uh, everybody, it's been a it's been a good group. I see Nick is here. Uh, good to see you again, Nick. Well, it's good to see you all, and we will see you next Sunday at two p.m. All being well. Thank you, JJ. Okay, life, flight, and love, everybody. Thanks, JJ.